How to manage the upcoming holidays with a PDA child. So today I wanna do a mini training for you guys about four things to think about as you're planning for either Hanukkah, Christmas, whatever holidays are coming up. And first I'm gonna tell you what we're doing for the holidays, but I want you to understand that this is after four years of taking this approach. So I'm gonna talk about four things. First, of course, accommodations and lowering demands. Hi, everybody. Um, two, contingency plans. Three, de-escalation and feeling comfortable with that. And then fourth, which is what I'm gonna start this with, is um, structural changes and looking at what doesn't work this year and making adjustments for the next year because this really is a long-term approach, obviously, for our kids' lives. So. This year, our family's plan is to have my older PDA son go with my husband to um, a ski resort up north, like four hours from where we live, driving with the service dog. And they're going to do all the dopamine and novelty activities, like going skiing, going on indoor water parks, going tubing, all these things that my son loves. So that's actually over Christmas. So that's going to be... Christmas Eve, Christmas, and the following day. And then I am taking my four-year-old son to my mother's where I grew up one year, one hour away from where we are and we're staying with her. And then when my husband comes back, I'm flying with my younger son to Alabama where my, where my dad lives for a special vacation with the four-year-old. So you'll notice we're completely separating the kids this holiday, which, you know, earlier on in my journey and four years ago, and still in moments would make me really sad because I always imagined that we would be spending holidays doing traditions and spending it together as a foursome. And someday we might, right? This is a season, but this is where we've come to after trying the accommodations, the contingency plans, going through the de-escalation and, and then taking the experience of previous years as data and leaning into what we could exchange, what we could change structurally so it would actually be a pleasant experience for everyone. So I'm gonna start out by explaining this sort of framework that I think through um, using the example of two years ago, Christmas two years ago. And we also celebrate lightly Hanukkah in my family because my mother-in-law is Jewish. So we have two holidays in the mix um, but this example is from Christmas so two years ago um, I knew that Christmas was going to be an enormous deal for my son because remember that excitement can also register as a loss of autonomy because the excitement is so such a big feeling inside their bodies it can make them feel like an internal loss of autonomy and then there's the external societal expectations of just like the christmas lights are up and you know they're hearing christmas songs and people are talking about it so even if you're not putting a ton of demands on your kid they're gonna be more activated during this time period. So this is actually like Halloween to my my PDA son's birthday in January. We call the gauntlet because it's like Halloween, my younger son's birthday, then it's Thanksgiving, then it's Christmas, then it's New Year's, then it's my older son's birthday. And it's just it's just a lot. It's a lot more than the rest of the year. So two years ago, we were really focused on accommodations, lowering demands, we're not gonna do as much, we're not gonna make as big of a deal about it, and we thought like, okay, this is gonna work. But there was a lot of activation around it, and so we did a contingency plan, which is like, okay, these, these Christmas presents under the tree are way too activating because they wanna rip them up right away, so why don't we try opening one each day? Right, And so we were like, oh, this is a brilliant idea. It's a little bit of dopamine, a little bit of novelty each day. It's gonna reduce the demand and of like waiting. And so we did that and it was still too much activation, right? It, and so I was like, okay, we accommodated in these ways. We're not going to all these events. We're not going to all these family activities. I'm not making him make Christmas cookies. I'm not sending out lowering demands for me. I'm not sending out Christmas cards anymore. That was a huge relief when I was just like, I'm not doing it. I can't. And then we go to the contingency plan. And I'm going to give you guys an example that you might, 
that might be helpful for you as you're thinking through your your Christmas plans or your holiday plans. So it didn't it didn't really help as much as we wanted to like change around how we were actually celebrating Christmas. But we kept trying. And the thing I was really anxious about was like, okay, he's not going to sleep because he gets when he gets activated, he doesn't sleep. So on Christmas Eve, he went to bed in a pretty normal way. And then he woke up screaming at like two in the morning, just like, I can't do this. I can't wait. Just like total panic attack, right? Like waiting for Santa to come. And I'm sure some of you guys have had this experience where the excitement and the waiting has really registered as this huge loss of autonomy and the child feels like panic in their body. So then I had to go into the third stage, which is de-escalation. And I want you guys to think of de-escalation and co-regulation as an accommodation, right? Because this approach isn't like we do all the accommodation, we make all the changes, and then there aren't any panic attacks, right? Like it's still a nervous system disability. So if you can start to feel more comfortable with like, okay, like I know how to de-escalate, right? So in the moment, I was like, okay, what can I do to de-escalate? I ran downstairs and got a, I got um, a Christmas present that we opened. I got like this whipped cream that I had made for a Christmas dinner and I put sprinkles all over it and we're like in the room getting sugar, getting dopamine, de-escalating. And it was a whole thing. And eventually it worked and his body calmed down, but it was a whole like half an hour to 45 minutes of, of him like thrashing around with his body and just being like, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't wait. So this is the fourth step. Okay. So what we learned was this is way too much for him, even with all the accommodations. Okay. Even with making contingency plans, even with knowing how to deescalate. And so that's what led us to the fourth, which is what I want you guys to think about big picture long term is like, collect what happens this year as data and allow yourself to make structural changes, which is what we did this year. And we'll see how it goes, right? This is the first year we're completely separating the family. And, you know, I think both of us intuitively feel good about it because even though we're not with each other and the kids aren't together, they're going to be getting a lot of family time. They're going to be getting a lot of parent time. And we're just, my husband and I are looking at it as like Christmas might not be the time that we get to connect as a couple. And there's grief in that, but it doesn't mean life is over, right? It's letting go of expectations. And so I want to bring this structure to potentially something you're worried about. And I hope I've chosen an example that's relevant for all of you. But a lot of times we have sort of a cognitive loop with these kids around visiting family, right? And this might just be going over to someone's house for a meal or going over to see the cousins. And so you can see these kids and teens get into a cognitive loop where they're like, I want to go, but I don't know if I can, right? And so the first step is really validating this, lowering the demands around it to the extent possible and accommodating. So like what this means practically is like, you know, bringing an iPad, having an out, having communicated with people where they're going to go that indicates like, hey, they might not sit at the table. Hey, they might need to be in another room. Hey, this is what might happen, right? So you're setting up them up for success. But that might not be enough, right? The day might come and then we have to have a contingency plan. And this this is where it gets sticky. Because, and, and people, parents, it's hard for us because we have to make choices of like, if the child is too activated, what is the plan? Right. So often we push ourselves and we push the kid into the situation because we've made a commitment or we don't want our in-laws to judge us or we really have attachment to how things are going to go in the Christmas season. Right. But we have to allow for that contingency plan in order to ha like have peace as a parent, especially not just in this holiday season, but in this season of your child's life and really grounding down into the moment of like, is it a good decision to make my child go to this dinner, right? And how am I going to deal with it as a parent 
how can I plan ahead and say, okay, like which one of us is going to stay home, which is what we did for Thanksgiving. Ultimately, my mother-in-law got sick and we hosted at our place, so it wasn't an issue. But these are the things that we have to think about. The third is like maybe you have the great accommodations. They do want to go to the friends, to the family's house and see family, but they have a panic attack or a meltdown. So then we want to get into the mindset of how can we lovely, lovingly de-escalate this and, and be prepared to do it in front of an audience. And that's really, really difficult, right? Like it's a practice. We often drop our focus on what we know to be true with the nervous system and co-regulation and autonomy when we have other people judging our parenting. Um, another thing to think about is like, how can we accomplish the goal of, I think, the holidays, which is like communing with people you love in a non-traditional way. So, you know, if you talk to your child and part of the cognitive loop is like, I really want to see my cousins, potentially you could make a more spontaneous trip to see the cousins, or you could find a way for them to be with the cousins not on the day of all the expectations and, and the dinner and the timing and all of that stuff. And then the fourth is, you know, if you do the accommodations, you have a contingency plan, you go through with it one way or another, then you want to reflect of like what worked, what didn't, and not judge yourself, right? And not judge your child of just like, oh, like, let's structure it. Let's structure it differently next year so that we can feel joy so that we can feel peace during the holidays, right? And and I think where we get stuck often is that we have so much attachment to the way things should be. And, I, and that happens to me too, um, especially around the holiday season because you see everybody else doing things a particular way. But I just want to let you guys know that we will not be doing a traditional thing. We will be splitting the family entirely. We're going all different places. We're not overlapping because I don't want equalizing behavior and I'm going to miss my husband for most of the two weeks and that's okay. It's just part of raising a child with a unique nervous system disability and I know in my heart that it's worth it and that we'll have other opportunities to have more quote traditional interactions as husband and wife. So I hope that's helpful to you guys for the holiday season. I know that someone in the DMs asked for a little training on holidays, um, but hopefully that will prompt you to think differently. Accommodations, contingency plans, de-escalation, and structural change, big picture. All right, everybody, have a good rest of your day, and I'll be on here, but if I don't see you, um, have a great holiday season, whatever you're celebrating. Oh, and I'll put this um, on the podcast. So if you want to listen to it again, um, I'm going to put it up on the podcast. All right, guys. See you later.